Hey guys, this is Stephen Lowe, and we're going to be covering Overcoming Gravity Online Part 2, and this is going to be still the first part of the Fundamental Knowledge Base, and in Chapter 2, we'll cover um, the physiology of strength and hypertrophy, um, what is strength and how to understand it, uh, the central nervous system and its role in improving neural adaptations for strength, um, the mechanisms of hypertrophy, hypertrophy and then also closed and open chain exercises. So let's get started. So what is strength? Um, the strength equation um, can generally be expressed as strength equals neural adaptations times hypertrophy or um, the muscle cross-sectional area. Um, and so if you took a muscle such as your biceps and just like grabbed it and was able to pull it out, the cross-sectional area is basically the, the circular round shape of the muscle here. And that is the, has all the components of the myosin and actin heads as they overlap and are able to pull and contract the muscle um, because of individual um, muscle cells within there, the sarcomeres um, contracting on top of each other. Um, so body weight training in general for holds or movements uh, it's fundamentally based on strength and hypertrophy, much like barbells. And so there are lots of factors that um, influence strength training. And a lot of the different ones that uh, we won't be covering in the series are like different limb lengths, um, angles of the muscles crossing the joints. Some uh, people have better ones of those than others. Um, the insertion points of muscles, usually the further it is or closer the insertion points of the muscles gain a specific leverage advantage. A lot of these things can't be changed, um, and some are changed as your muscles grow bigger, which give you a better advantage. So um, those things can play a role, but obviously can't play a role in our training, so we're not gonna cover those in super depth. Um, generally speaking, uh, going over like one of the common misconceptions of bodyweight training is that um, usually those people who have the highest strength to weight ratio for body weight training, gymnastics, um, climbing, whatever body weight sport out there, they're the most jacked for their weight. Um, so for example, if you think of, um, rings gymnasts or the top calisthenics athletes, usually those people have the most amount of muscle, uh, as possible to naturally fit on their frame. Uh, and that is giving them the most uh, strength to body weight ratio. So common misconception that staying lighter and not having a lot of muscle mass is going to maximize your strength to body weight ratio. So if you're aiming for upper level movements like uh, the planche or Maltese or any of the like super hard calisthenic exercises, you're going to want to put on as much muscle as naturally possible generally to maximize your body weight to strength ratio. Um, likewise, we see a similar thing happening with weight classes as well, um, your Olympic lifting, your wrestling. Most of these people are like super jacked for their size. So um, yeah, that's a common misconception. And uh, mo most people think with uh, their sport that, um, yeah, staying lighter is the best, but things like uh, climbing, even if you look at most of the elite performers, they have a lot of muscle mass for their size, or at least more than... Um, your average Joe who is, you know, in the middle or even advanced and wants to get stronger, um, usually putting on more mass is more helpful. So the central nervous system, um, some of the basics on muscle fibers, um, your fast switch fibers in your muscles are comprised of uh, type 2A and 2X fibers. And these are general termed as your high threshold motor units, whereas slow twitch fibers are your type 1 fibers and they're termed low threshold. Uh, what low threshold and high threshold means is that when your brain sends an electrical signal from your motor neurons to your muscle, um, basically it sends them at a certain threshold. So if it's lifting something light like a book, um, although my book is pretty heavy, if it's lifting something light, it'll send a lower threshold signal to your muscles um, in order to lift the book since it knows it's not as heavy. Whereas if you're lifting a piece of furniture that is, you know, hundreds of pounds, it's going to send a stronger signal to your uh, muscles in order to recruit more muscle fibers. 
Um, so this process follows um, the Henneman size principle, which says that uh, low threshold motor units are always recruited before your high threshold motor units. And what this means in terms of us for strength and hypertrophy is that um, usually the high threshold motor units, your fast switch fibers, those are have the greatest potential for hypertrophy and strength, um, which means that we want to preferentially try to get those working during our strength training and hypertrophy training more as um, more fatigue and more work onto those muscles are going to make them stronger and bigger over time. Um, so this is why strength training uses um, the low repetition maximum. So usually like uh, one to five or six reps um, because low uh, repetitions usually means you're using heavier weights and heavier weights means you're recruiting more uh, muscle fibers. Um, similarly, um, this can actually be gotten around with um, the accelerating tempo. So the, the common one zero X zero, the X specifies that you're accelerating the move very fast. So like instead of doing a deadlift, you may do like a power clean where you're pulling the weight up really fast or um, with push-ups or dips, you're performing the concentric where you're pushing really fast uh, during those motions in order to uh, get most of the muscle fibers recruited during that stage to fatigue your fast switch ones, which will lead to greater strength and hypertrophy benefit in the long run. Um, so some of the common neural adaptations for strength um, recruitment is a common one. Uh, I believe in untrained individuals, if I remember correctly, you, you recruit about 30% um, of your muscle fibers and the percentage can go up as you strength train. Um, rate coding is the faster firing of the motor units. Um, so for example, um, usually in more of the postural muscles and calves and forearms, usually you have a greater percentage of uh, slow twitch fibers, which means um, rate coding is the primarily, primary way in which your body increases strength in those particular muscles. So that's why a lot of calf and uh, forearm and back training may use higher reps uh, for hypertrophy just because they have greater percentages of slow twitch muscle fibers, and that's how you can fatigue them more effectively um, in order to produce uh, gains. Um, synchronization is basically more motor units firing at the same time. Um, motor units comprise of, uh, they go when they go to the muscles, basically they go to various fibers uh, with muscle fibers within the muscle uh, randomly. And so um, as a group, when in your brain, your body wants to fire them all at the same time, kind of like a uh, tug of war. If you have people pulling out of sync, they can't pull as effectively as all the people on the same side pulling at once, going one, two, three, pull, you know, one, two, three, pull. You get more force output because pulling at the same time gives more force than um one person trying to pull at one time, another person trying to pull at a different time. Um, so that's a good analogy for that. Um, contribution is the timing of different motor units firing different muscles. So um, for example, you could work out your biceps and your lats and chest uh, with like pullovers for the chest and lats and bicep curls for uh, your biceps to get stronger, um, but once you started training pull-ups, obviously you need to coordinate the chest and lats as well as biceps in order to get better at that movement. So like someone who had only trained the muscles separate is not going to be as coordinated as someone who has trained uh, the pull-ups or rows from the beginning with the compound exercises with the muscles coordinating with each other. Um, finally, we have antagonist inhibition and motor learning. Um, basically, uh, antagonist inhibition is decrease in resistance from muscles opposite of the muscle group you're working. So for example, with an L-sit, um, when you're working your abs and your hip flexors, sometimes people's hamstrings can be tight enough that it's pulling uh, your legs down instead of, uh, you know, being looser to hold the muscles, uh, hold the L-sit and even go into a V-sit. And that's why, um, decreasing the resistance of the opposing muscle groups can help uh, increase your strength on the opposite side muscle groups. 
And similarly with motor learning, the more used to a motor pattern, the more practice you get with it, the better you get at it. So um, this is where the common saying, strength as a skill, the more you practice a specific movement, the better you get at it. Um, and this is also the one of the fundamentals underlying grease the groove training, where you do a lot of um, non-failure work with a specific exercise in order to get better at that specific exercise and learn it better. Um, so the central nervous system in general works as a governor of exercise and has a set amount of work capacity. Uh, I talked about a little bit this in the previous video, but uh, you can think about the work capacity of the central nervous system as a pool. And so exercise is going to take away from that pool, um, whereas recovery factors like sleep, um, good sports nutrition, uh, low stress is going to uh, add recovery ability pool, add water back in. And so um, you actually build a bigger pool over time. So a beginner who does like four to six sets of exercise is pretty going to be pretty fatigued uh, in those particular muscle groups. But if you've been training for several months or several years, you generally be able to handle a greater capacity of exercise. And this is one of the reasons why when beginners who want to try like specific professional athlete uh, athletes workouts, they don't do well because the, the professional athletes workout capacity is way higher because they've been building it up for years, usually decades or longer. Um, and they have the capacity to train very often um, and they're not usually training, you know, with super high intensity all the time either. So uh, understanding that workout work capacity increases over time is important and to make sure that you're within the range of the specific work capacity that you have right now because that is the best way to uh, get gains be within the range and um, be able to work out enough to stimulate your muscles and your strength to improve because if you do too much you could get overuse injuries or you plateau uh sooner because you have excessive fatigue accumulating and so uh, you need to understand that uh, your work capacity is a, a set amount and that you want to be within its specific range um so uh, one example that we can use is powerlifters uh, who are deadlifting like 600 plus pounds um, since deadlifts use pretty much all the muscle groups in the body from your upper body all the way down through your lower body they can be very fatiguing on the central nervous system because you're firing all the motor units at once. And so um, in understanding that, uh, basically uh, the, you can switch exercise. Power lifters often may only do deadlifts maybe once or twice, uh, once every uh, one to two weeks and uh, not more, and use other exercises to provide a continual stimulus to the body either lighter with more explosive exercises or uh, variations of deadlifts like uh, rack pulls or, or deficits in order to train specific range of motions that they're weak at in order to improve at the movement without necessarily training super heavy with the deadlift all the time. Um, so overreaching in that aspect is overtaxing the body system and what happens when you do that is the as the fatigue is accumulating, um, you can use a deload to uh, reduce the fatigue and improve the body's capacity over time. So the three main exercises uh, mechanisms of hypertrophy are your mechanical tension, um, where high enough loads are placed on the muscles. Usually this is in the lower rep ranges, um, three to five RM is common usually not one to two because it's hard to get enough volume at one to two reps in order to progress. Uh, muscle damage is usually in your moderate rep ranges, usually a uh, term from about five to 12, maybe five to 15 reps. And this is about 90% um, one rep max to about 70%. And within this range, the weight is heavy enough that um, during the eccentric phase or muscle lengthening phase of the exercise, you get uh, muscle damage where the myosin heads are pulled off of the um, actin and that creates damage in the muscles. Um, the satellite cells surrounding the muscle will donate their nuclei to the specific muscle cells and 
the extra myonuclei will basically increase protein synthesis. So um, the extra myonuclei are what are called, um, so like if you've ever heard of muscle memory, where an athlete may have gotten big muscles, but then they're sedentary for a while and their muscles get smaller. The reason why their muscles come back to a bigger size much more quickly than somebody who is sedentary all their life is because of the extra satellite cell donation myonuclei. They sit in muscle. And so like when an athlete comes back and starts working out again, they already have the extra nuclei to promote protein synthesis to get the muscle back to where it was beforehand. Uh, metabolic stress or metabolite accumulation is the third mechanism. And basically this is in high repetitions. So usually 15, 20 plus um, up to about 30, which is where you get the pump and you start to feel the acidic burn in your muscles. And uh, this is the third mechanism of hypertrophy. So most of the recent research in the past several years has shown that anywhere in about the five to 30 rep range will uh, work for hypertrophy gaining. And uh, this is a little bit different than um, what it was commonly thought a few decades ago. Usually uh, most people are like, okay, you need to train with mostly the heavier weights or at least in the muscle damage uh, rep ranges. And so this is kind of makes sense, uh, at least thinking about it, theoretically, um, you have both fast and slow twitch fibers. And so to maximize hypertrophy, you want to maximize the fast switch fibers, which is heavier loads and muscle damage. Then you also want to maximize the slow twitch fibers, which are uh, more predicated to endurance. And so the, the, getting the pump and working the high reps will tend to focus on the slow twitch fibers more to maximize hypertrophy. Um, alternatively, there was some debate on whether there is a difference between myofibular and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Um, high reps were thought to, with the uh, met metabolic stress, were thought to um, increase the fluid retention in the muscles and make the muscles bigger, but not be as good as myofibular, which is increase of the protein components within the muscle, uh, the myosin and actin. Um, however, um, it's not really relevant training wise. Um, there may be some truth to that. Uh, the, the research has kind of been kind of back and forth a little, um, but it's not relevant training wise. Usually in our case, a bigger muscle is going to be a stronger muscle as long as you're strength training. So in that respect, uh, it doesn't matter too much. Finally, open and closed chain exercises. Um, so open kinetic chain uh, or OKC exercises, uh, you're generally, your limb is more free to move throughout the range of motion. And you can think of dumbbells um, with like dumbbell bench, you have to control the dumbbell in space. And so that is an open chain exercise. Alternatively, Closed kinetic chain exercises are movements where your limbs are not free. And you can think of this as like squats or push-ups where your hands are fixed on the ground and not moving or your feet are fixed on the ground. And then you also have somewhere in between that, which is semi-open or semi-closed chain, depending on how you look at it. Um, some A common example of this is bench press where your hands are free to move back and forth, uh, up and down, but since you're holding a bar, and the bar is fixed and you're not allowed to move side by side. Um, so generally speaking, closed and semi-closed chain exercises tend to be best for building strength. Um, basically, you're reducing the degrees of freedom of movement, like with dumbbells moving, you have to stabilize any which way. And so um, the less stability you have to do, as long as the exercise is working major muscle groups effectively, it tends to be better for strength and hypertrophy. Um, for example, you can see this with um, handstand push-ups versus um, overhead press. Overhead press, you're semi-closed chain, you're pushing a barbell up and overhead, whereas handstand push-ups, you have to stabilize your body in space. And so um, a bunch of your energy is dedicated to stabilizing your body as opposed to moving the weight. Um, on the other hand, uh, open connect chain and semi-open can be very beneficial for specific goals such as um, rings. Uh, rings is our semi uh, mostly open chain, a little bit of closed since uh, the rings tend to stabilize themselves very slightly. 
Um, prehab and rehab, such as using isolation exercises to get specific muscle groups stronger, and isolation work, obviously, for you know, like bicep curls, um, tricep extensions. So um, basically, most of our exercises, we want to be uh, mostly closed chain or semi-closed chain, and then we can use open chain exercises um, to fill in the gaps or bring up specific weaknesses.